I pray this song be a blessing to your heart tonight. You may be down and feel that God has somehow forgotten that you are faced with circumstances you can't get through. Right now it seems that there's no way out and you're going under. But God's proven time and time again He'll take care of you and He'll do it again. He'll do it again. Just take a look and where you are now and where you've been hasn't he always come through for you he's the same now as then you may not know how you may not know when but he'll do it again god knows the things you're going through and he knows how you're hurting. He knows your heart and that it's been broken in two. He's the God of the sun, the stars and the seas, and he is your father. He can calm the storm and he'll find some way to fix this for you. And he'll do it again, he'll do it again. Just take a look at where you are now and where you've been. Hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same now as then. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. All right, Brother Mark, come preach. Amen. Good, good video. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Well, if you wouldn't mind turning your Bibles this evening over to Matthew chapter 16, uh, you know, I know. I, I, you're always kind of nervous about showing videos about how well they'll be received, but I thought it would be pretty safe to show a video where the last scene is uh, Brother Wayne's grandson baptizing someone. I thought that was going to be a hit either way, uh, you know, maybe not at all churches, but at least at this one. Uh, but man, it's such a joy to be here. I do appreciate my family. Uh, for those that don't know, I had an opportunity to grow up at Whitfield Baptist Church. Um, we came here uh, when I was 12 years old. Uh, and uh, it was kind of a weird situation. Uh, my stepdad had a friend uh, who was uh, who had another friend who was coming here through a ministry. It was actually the Providence Ministers at that time. They were bringing uh, P, they were bringing uh, some of their shut-ins. Or I don't know what you call them. Uh, they're uh, the guys that were having drinking problems uh, that were staying at their place. Whatever you want to call those guys. Uh, I'm trying to think of a word right now, and it's just not coming to my brain. Yes, the guys he's ministering to. And uh, they were coming to church here, and my stepdad uh, had an uh, alcohol problem. Uh, he was uh, a drunkard. And uh, he, you know, when he found out his friend was also coming to Whitfield Baptist Church, he said, man, I want to go to that church as well. Uh, because my mom was, like, making him go to church, and he hated it. He's like, well, at least I can go where my friend is going, Mike Ledford. And uh, we started coming to Whitfield Baptist Church when I was 12, and we've ne we never left. And I praise the Lord for how this church has impacted our family uh, and how it's, it continues impacting our family. Uh, just seeing how the gospel is going out around the world uh, through the doors of Whitfield Baptist Church. And I want to encourage you, man, just be involved in your church. Be thankful for what God has given you. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of times we can, we can complain. And I know we, we have, we're part of a ministry where there's several missionaries and, man, even, or even with missionaries, you can get in kind of an attitude where everybody starts complaining about what's wrong. Uh, and, you know, no matter where you, where you are, I can promise you there's always going to be some, something that's going on that's wrong. Because we haven't 
uh, had our glorified bodies yet. We're all going to make a lot of mistakes. And I just encourage you, man, just get involved and make, uh, you know, just serve and do all you can do uh, to make much of Jesus Christ. Amen? We come here to Matthew chapter, 17, uh, Matthew chapter 16. Uh, I'm sorry. And uh, let's begin reading here Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 21. The Bible says here in verse 20, 21, For from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. As we open up this portion of scripture here, you have, of course, Jesus is explaining to his disciples the plan or the layout of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying, guys, I want you to understand that I came to this earth to die. I came to give my life on an old rugged cross. He was laying it out, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And man, I hope this evening, uh, I know we have usually the most faithful uh, group in our churches come on Sunday evenings, but man, I hope we know that everyone here this evening has come to the place where they have trusted the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope you've come to understand that Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, came to this earth and lived a sinless, perfect life. And not only did he live, but he came to die on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he was actually taking the, my, the punishment that I deserved. He was paying the sin debt that I owed. And not only that, but when Jesus died on the cross, he was buried. And he rose again three days later to prove that he was who he said he was. And to prove that he had victory over sin and death and the grave. Amen? And uh, man, uh, the, Jesus is laying out. He's saying, guys, I want you to understand what the gospel is. I want you to understand what my plan is. Now, you're about to have a missions conference coming up this, this next month. And really what the mission conference is, is understanding the plan of Jesus Christ and saying, hey, I want to be a part of that plan. Sure. I want to be a part of that plan. Because we know the gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, understand something, folks. The gospel is what the Holy Spirit works through to make people into new creatures. The gospel changed my life. And you know, the gospel is the only thing that can change your life. If you've never trusted the gospel of Jesus Christ, your life needs to be changed by the gospel. You know, we fail, folks, in our Christian life when we stop sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, he was carrying, you know, he was, he was uh, just laying out the summer here saying, hey, guys, this is what's going to happen. Do you understand when people men, uh, surrender to go to the mission field, they're surrendering to carry out the plan of the gospel? Right. You know, the reason my wife and I, uh, I decided, hey, we're going to go to Peru first when we were first married and then end up going to South Africa the reason why we go, are going to those fields is because we have a desire to pl carry out the plan that Jesus Christ has laid out for us. Mark 6, 16, 15, and he said to them, go you into all the world and preach what? The gospel to every creature, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And understand, folks, as we're about to have this missions conference, surrendering to be a sender is surrendering to carry out the plan of the gospel. Supporting a missionary is your church's plan to share the gospel in the places that you can't be. It's the gospel. I mean, so many times we, we hear it and we take it and it, and it's kind of, it can, can become kind of flippant to us and we can take it for granted. But we need to understand God's plan of salvation is his gospel. You have number one, you see the gospel, you see God's plan, the death, burial, and resurrection. The second thing I want us to notice is go here in verse number 22. It says in verse 23, it says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, I want you to understand, Jesus was talking to his disciples. And just a few verses before this took place, Jesus came, and you can look in verse 13 and 14, and Jesus says, Hey guys, I want, you, I want, to, I want to know something. Who do men say that I am? And the disciples started answering him. They said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elias. And he says, okay, I know what they say. What, but who do you say that I am? 
And Mr. Peter, who is usually the big mouth, the one who speaks the first, and usually, you know, gets himself in trouble, this time he gave a good answer. And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the one that we've been waiting for. You're the Messiah. You're a God in human flesh. So understand, he says, who do you say I am? And Peter stood up and said, hey, hey, you're God. You're the Messiah. You're the truth. You're the light. You're the one that we've been waiting for. That's who you are. And he says, you're right, Peter. That's who I am. And then we have, he says, and because of who I am, I'm going to tell you about the plan of salvation, the gospel of death, burial, and resurrection. And then we have Peter speaks up again the second time in verse 22 and began to rebuke him and saying, be it far from the Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, understand here something, folks. Peter, uh, Peter rebukes Jesus because he doesn't like his plan. You know, I can imagine Peter's plan kind of, uh, and dreams kind of went up in the smoke. You know, he may have been a loudmouth, but I believe he felt like he was like number one or two in charge. And he knew Jesus was setting up his kingdom, and he said, hey, I'm first or second in command, so hey, this is going to be a pretty good deal for me. But when, when Jesus shared that with Peter, Peter was like, no, 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 and he rebuked him. You know, a lot of Christians have that reaction when it comes to God's plan a lot of times. We pray, we, you know, we pray, pray for our children to get saved. We pray for our spouse many times to get saved. And when they do, and God wants to send them across the world, we kind of stay back, we kind of stand back and say, no, 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 wait, 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 that wasn't in my plan. That wasn't what I had in mind when I was wanting my family to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know, I had a pretty picture of what it was going to be like. You know, my family was going to be over here, and my son was going to be over here, and my daughter was going to be over here with their family, and we're going to all go to church together, and we'll just live happily ever after going to church. And a lot of times when we hear the gospel and we find out the, 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 the requirements of the gospel, we find out, hey, that Jesus wants us to take this message that changed our life and not only keep it ourselves, to take it to share it with everyone around the world. And what Peter was saying by this, he was looking at Jesus and saying, Jesus, I know that you're God, but you're wrong. I know that you're God, but you're wrong. I don't like your plan. I don't, want, I don't like what you have in mind here. I know you're God, but you're wrong. You know, as you look at this verse, it kind of appears that Peter was just being caring and thoughtful. You know, a lot of times we try to justify our lack of involvement with God's plan with good intentions. You know, we're really praying about being a missionary when our kids get out of the house, when they grow up. You know, I really want to be a missionary, but man, I need to take care of my parents. I need to take care of my mom. Even as missionaries, you'd be amazed working in different parts of the world. And they say, man, I, you know, it's just too dangerous to work in that part of town. How many times have we said that in our own city? It's not safe for my family. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, 11 and 12, you find a list of men and women that God mentioned in these, in these chapters. And I can remember when I was in children's church, I actually I was, took over as a children's pastor here at Whitfield. Uh, we went on a mission, I went on a mission trip for five months in Peru, South America in 1995. I came back, and when I came back, uh, Brother Tony put, Brother Tony Howarth, who was our assistant pastor at that time, put me in charge of the children's ministry. And when he put me in charge of the children's ministry, he gave me a children's book, and he said, here, have at it, and go for it. And that book that he gave me uh, was Faith Hall of Fame. And it was a, a book, it was a, a Sunday school curriculum, really, that went over Hebrews chapter 11 and 12. And a lot of times we can look at those chapters and we can look and see how, you know, we see all those feats and all those things that those men of, and women of God did. And we're like, man, that's God's brag chapters. He's like, hey, I want you to look at my super Christians here in chapters 11 and 12. But 
really, as we look at those chapters, it didn't have anything to do with God wanting to brag on his Christians. What he was want, trying to do is get us to learn what it meant to live by faith. Amen. He says, the, the elders, they obtained a good report because they lived by faith. And a lot of times when we think about living by faith, we have the idea that faith is God is going to take care of us. He's going to keep us safe. You now, if I say, well, you know, what is faith? And faith is, man, we trust God's going to take care of us. But folks, that's not what faith is. You understand, faith is believing who God is and what God's plan is. Faith is believing that, that when God says that he created the world from, from the words that he spoke, that that is 100% accurate. Faith is believing that when he talks about eternity and that, that everyone in this world will spend a place either in the lake of fire or in heaven with him for all eternity. When he says that, having faith means I 100% completely believe with what God says. You know, we look at people like Abraham, many times it was mentioned in, in Hebrews chapter 11. And we say, well, God, you know, he had faith and he believed God and God bl blessed him and kept him safe. God used him and God made him rich. So faith is God making us rich and God keeping us safe. That's not what faith is. You know, there's a, a list of men there. And we see Abraham, as we see what happened in his life, he was willing to move from this place to this place because God said, Abraham, go. And what did Abraham do? Abraham took off. We see men like Noah who changed his entire career because of what God said. He believed God so deeply, he said, hey, my life's different from now on. My life's work is building a boat because I believe in so deeply what God said. You look through and you say, well, God made people rich and he blessed people. Then you look in Hebrews chapter 12 and some of those people that believed God were sown in half. Where are the riches? Where's the safety? I want you to understand something. Safety isn't guaranteed in faith. The faith is the idea of, man, we believe God so deeply that we're willing to do anything that he wants us to do. And we're willing to obey and follow his plan no matter what it takes. Right. You know, I, I can remember just a, a little over a year and a half ago, I would, uh, my second oldest son, Chase, we have a car that he was driving there in South Africa before he came back to the States. Uh, and it, it always overheated. Uh, you, you know, it had a leak in there. I think it was a water pump or something. I can't remember. But it was always leaking water. And I said, hey, Chase, you got to make sure that you keep water in the car so it doesn't overheat. Well, as a lot of teenagers do, he takes off without checking the water. And he was actually going to our church and he was going to youth meeting and uh, they were doing outreach before the youth meeting and then going to the youth meeting. And he took two of his friends with him. And don't be surprised, as he was driving his car to the youth meeting, the car broke down because it overheated. And he pulled over the side of the road and he calls and he says, hey, Uncle Mark, he says, hey, I'm in trouble. The car broke down. I'm not sure what to do. And I said, Chase, did you check the water? Did you make sure? And so I was upset. You know, I'm a good 20 minutes away. And he says, I need some help. And I'm like fussing. And I hang up the phone. And I'm arguing with Amy. And I was like, oh, I can't believe you didn't check the water in the car. Well, about five minutes later, Chase calls me again. But when he calls me, he calls me from a different number that I didn't recognize. And he said, hey. And I was like, hey, bud. Uh, I, was, I think I said a little bit more harsh, harsh than that. I said, what phone are you calling? He said, well, Uncle Mark, he said, I'm sorry. He said, uh, I got held up by gunpoint. And the guy stole my wallet, and he stole my phone, and he stole the other guy's phone. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I can't be mad anymore right now. I'm like, I've got to go, and, uh, uh, you know, so I worked it out, and they were able to go to the youth meeting and, and go to the, the outreach. But do you understand the next week when it came youth meeting time and it came outreach time, the chase went back to church the same way? He didn't say, hey, because I went through this danger and I went through this possibility of getting held up by gunpoint, 
that's going to keep me from serving and doing what God wants me to do with my life. It was kind of interesting. He had one of his friends from a church in town who his dad never let him go out in the townships where our churches were because the areas were, were too dangerous. And the one time that his dad gave him permission to go, they get held up by gunpoint. I was like, ah. Oh. Well, needless to say, that dad never let his son go back. But Chase says, hey, I can't let that keep us from going to share the gospel. You know, the, you know, safety and security isn't our main goal. Our main goal is to be obedient to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, one thing I understand is, man, when you try to be obedient to God's plan, parents will object. Friends will be upset. Lost people won't understand. I'm in South Africa a lot of times, and people are like, why in the world are you here? Everybody in South Africa wants to go to America, and why are you here? It's because we understand the plan that Jesus has to get the gospel message around the world. We come and look in verse 23. He said, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, <coughs> but those that be of men. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. Now look here, folks. Peter offended God because he didn't savor the things of God, but he savored the things of men. He didn't have an appetite for the things of God. I can remember when I first went to work in Peru. Uh, there was a famous Peruvian dish that everybody ate, even the missionaries. And it was called ceviche. And you may have heard of ceviche, but ceviche, another word for, another idea of looking at ceviche is raw fish. This marinated in lemon juice. So when I got to Peru and people were like, oh, you got to try this. And I tried it and I was like, yeah, it sounds just like, I thought, it, I mean, it tastes just like I thought it was going to taste. It wasn't very pleasant, in other words. But you know, as I started living in Peru and learning their culture and being around the people and uh, you know, tasting other foods. I can't, it came to be where that plate of ceviche was one of my favorite plates that I craved on a regular basis. It's like when I got around it, I started wanting more of it. When I got around that culture, I started wanting more of it. And, you know, a lot of times, it's like that with the things of God. You know, we, we come and uh, yeah, at first, when we hear the gospel, it, 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 it kind of is offensive to us. But the more we start hearing the gospel preached, the more we get around other believers, the more the th we start craving the things of God. The more we, we love hearing the preaching of the word of God. Because we get more used to it. And we start craving it. But so sometimes it's on the opposite side. You know, sometimes we can come and, and have so much of the world put in our heart and our mind where we stop craving the things of God and we start craving the things of men. And see, that's what was happening in Peter's life. Peter was coming up and, he's, and, uh, and, 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 and Jesus was telling Peter truth, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, and he's like, no, I don't want that. I want this other thing. And Jesus rebukes him and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't savor, you don't crave the things of God, you crave the things of men. Let me ask you here, folks, tonight. What are you craving? Are you craving the things of God? Are you craving the things of men? What kind of palate do you have? You know, when you hear that God doesn't like something, does that bother you? When God says homosexuality is wrong, does that bother you? When God says that sex outside of marriage is wrong, does that bother you? When God says that you should give to missions and you should tithe, man, I want to know tonight, is that something that bothers you? When God says that you should be a missionary, your child should be a missionary, does that bother you? Are you offended by what God says? 
You understand, when we go against God, we're playing for the other team. We're playing for the other team. He looks at Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Man, you're going after the things of the world and not after the things of God. You're, sa- you're savoring the opposite of what I like. And I don't know about you guys, but man, I want to love what God loves and I want to hate what God hates. Man, I want to have the, I want to I savor. Man, if God loves it and God wants it and it's in God's plan, man, that's the direction that I want to go in. But so many times, man, we dabble in the things of the world where we start craving those kind of things instead of craving what God has for us. Verse 24, the Bible says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He says, Do you really want to be someone who savors the things of God and not the things of man? Well, here's the plan. It's laid out for you. Then said Jesus to the disciples, if any man will come after me, verse 24, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross, and follow me. The first thing we see is you have to deny yourself. It's not about you, and it's not about your family. It's about Jesus. It's not about you, and it's not about your family. It's about Jesus. The second thing, take up your cross. Our goal should not be to live for security. I mean, so many times I I, I have conversations with people and their main goal in their life is not about pleasing God or following his plan to get the gospel message around the world. Their, their, Their whole idea is keeping themselves safe and secure. Well, I could not change this job. I mean, I would lose that retirement. I could not lose, you know, I could not change directions because, man, my my retirement would go up in smoke. I can't work in that area of town. It's too dangerous. I can't do this. It may put my children at harm. But faith isn't about living for security. You know, my son got held up by gunpoint and kind of a, not really comical, but when, when that guy took my son's wallet, my son was there and he said, he said, uh, he said, Uncle Mark, I said, I think I could have taken him, but I was a little worried about the guys in the back, you know, a bullet hitting them or something. He said, but when he took my wallet, I said, hey, uh, do you mind giving my license back? Because you, that's not going to help you any. So the guy looked at the wallet, he took the money out, uh, folded up the wallet and threw the wallet back at him. There was, it was, we were thankful because he had his bank cards and his license, but he mainly wanted to make sure he had his driver's license so he could drive in South Africa. <clears throat> well, a few months passed after that, and uh, Luke and I, uh, we were going to our Bible study that we have on Tuesday afternoons. Every week we have a lady from our church that allows, allows us to use her home where we bring the teenagers that want to continue growing in the Word of God um, and we bring there, and man, I have an opportunity to, to, to teach and preach to them in about two hours. Uh, and we, it's every Tuesday at 4 o'clock, like clock, clockwork. And Luke and I, we went in uh, this one Tuesday afternoon, and uh, Luke sat down. He sat on the chair beside me, and I was sitting here kind of in the middle of the room. It was just a small, if you can, it was a small house. It was a two-bedroom house. The, the size of the living room was probably square from the platform, about this big. Just a very small living room. We probably had eight or nine or ten teenagers kind of crammed in that, in that uh, living room there. And as we were getting ready, I was looking at my phone. I was reading some things before class started. And my assistant pastor came through the door. And as he came through the door, he was just walking straight. And when he walked straight, uh, there was a young man that came up behind him and kind of pushed him. And I thought they were kind of like joking around. Uh, my assistant pastor would a lot of times bring uh, visitors to that class because he knew, man, if I brought, he brought a visitor, I could share the gospel with him for an hour or so. So he came in, he put, I thought they were friends. And uh, he turned around and looked at me, and, uh, and he, he, he saw my phone, he grabbed my phone, and he kind of tried to pull my phone out of my hands, and I was like, man, what are you doing? And I pulled my phone back. 
And then when I pulled my phone back, there, his friend came through the door and he took a pistol and he pointed it right at my chest. I was like, oh, I know what's going on. I see. And he was sitting there, and he's like, oh, okay. And he was like, uh, I was like, oh, and, and the teens, they saw what was going on, and the owner of the house, she saw what was going on, and everybody started getting nervous. I said, hey, guys, just calm down. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Come in. Uh, just sit down. Just be quiet. And he was giving us orders and going around the house, ransacking the house, taking phones. And he grabbed my phone. He grabbed my computer. Uh, I lost my computer that day. He even went to try to take off Luke's tennis shoes, and he reached down to pull his shoes, and Luke was like, what are you doing, man? And he just kind of pulled away, so he just walked on. And then he asked me for my wallet. He kind of reached back, and I said, I'll give it to you, and I gave him my wallet. <coughs> and uh, when I gave him my wallet, I got to thinking what Chase did. And I was like, hey, uh, you don't need my license. Can you give my license back to me? And he looked at my wallet, he takes the cash out and throws the wallet back down. I was like, thank you, Chase, for going through that. I was talking to my pastor, and I was telling him about Brother Austin Gardner. I was, I was telling him what happened, and he said, uh, did you share the gospel with him? I was like, oh, junk. I didn't. I said, next time. That'll be, you know, ask for my wallet, then share the gospel. And I got a plan worked out for the third time. But you know, folks, when, it, when you talk about taking up your cross, you're not living your life based on security. You're living your life based on obedience. It says, follow Jesus. You know, there's a song that uh, was out a few years ago. That I, don't, I don't condone this song, but it's called Jesus Take the Wheel. And kind of the idea is like when you mess things up, let go of the wheel and let Jesus take, take control after you mess things up. Well, God, that's not what, you know, following Jesus is saying, hey, wherever you direct me, that's where I'm going. Amen. Wherever you tell me to go, that's where I'm going to take off to. He says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. It's God's plan. He's the one in charge. He's the one who says, hey, guys, this is what I've laid out, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Believe on me and you can have eternal life. Now that you've believed on me, take what I've given you and share it with every creature around this world. That's what my plan is. And we believers, man, we have to come to the point, man, are we going to follow his plan? Are we going to savor his plan? Are we going to crave what he craves? Are we going to love what he loves? Or are we going to play for the other team? And we say, Jesus, I know you're God, but you're wrong. Is that how we're going to live our life? Verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. It's for Christ's sake. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about my family. It's about Christ. There's a big thing going around the world today about which lives matter. You know whose lives matter? His life matters. You know, one thing about being a missionary family that you didn't really think about when you surrender a long time ago, i am give you a little inside view here, Blank. You know, leaving your family is pretty difficult. Uh, you know, some, some it's easier for some than others. Probably a little easier for me than it was for my wife. It's because they say I'm cold-hearted. And that's probably true. But one thing that we're learning is that, you know, we left our family, but there's a time where members of our family start leaving us. It's not so fun anymore. It's not so fun anymore. And, man, I've got one child that's raising support to go to Canada. I have one that's going to go to, man, he may go to India or wherever it may be. Luke's talking about going to Mexico. I'm just praying that God will, let, will call one of my kids to come work with us in Africa one day. Praise, hopefully. 
But you know what? It's not about my family. It's about Christ. It's not about my comfort. It's about Christ. You know, I told my son when he's deciding where to go, I said, you know, the thing is, man, I'm hoping that you come to work in, in Africa. But I want you to know something, Luke. If I never see you again in this world, we have eternity. We have eternity. And man, I hope there's, if there's one thing that we've learned through this virus and all this chaos and junk, is man, I hope we come to the place where we're not living for this world. But man, we have such a faith grounded in what God has said that man, we're, we, this life is just a vapor and what is to come is what we're living for. Those men in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 12, they were willing to lay down their lives. Moses was, was willing to, to turn away from the most powerful position in the world, the most powerful nation in the world, and say, no, I reject that because I believe so deeply in what my God has promised me. Peasant slaves were willing to look at the strongest soldiers in the world and say, no, I think I'll keep our baby safe. And even when it came to time, I even have faith to put my kid in a river because I believe my God over any of y'all. Is that how we're living our life? Are we living in a life based on faith, based on trusting God's plan, knowing that he was the creator and that what he promised us for eternity is true? Is that what we're living our life for? It's not about me. It's not about my family. It's about Christ. You know, my wife jokes with me. She said, you know, Losing Tyler is hard, and losing Chase is hard, and even losing Luke's going to be a little hard. And he said, but when Emily leaves, I'm going with her. <laughs> but you know, it's not about us. It's not about who I can stay close to. It's about Jesus. Let's give our life for him to take the gospel message around the world. Let's be on his team and not pay, play for the other team. Let's do it all for him and not for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity of being in your house. God, help us, Lord, to love your word. Help us to love your plan. Help us to love and savor and crave the things of God and not the things of man. In Jesus' name I pray.